welcome to our 15th episode of uh, marvelous medicines uh, today our uh, guest should i say or uh, speaker is uh, dr chandrashekar ramurthy he is the executive vice president of uh, kims group of hospitals hyderabad he is also the chief of strategy and growth association of artificial intelligence in healthcare uh, last episode uh, when we discussed about the artificial intelligence in medicine uh dr sham vishveshwaran specifically mentioned that probably what we need is people with dual qualifications that is those who have done uh, medicine as well as uh, ai similarly uh, i personally feel that uh, for um, hospital management also we need people who are dual qualified because people who don't have a background in medicine and lead a healthcare organization don't seem to understand where we doctors come from and uh, vice versa we don't seem to understand the business side of it so we have uh, quite a few people in india and the rest of the world doctors who have gone on to hospital management and one of them is uh, dr chandrashekar ramurthy he did his mbbs from jipma and md radiology also from jipma subsequently he did his advanced imaging fellowship from uh, nims then he decided to do hospital administration he did it from icfai he's also done uh, a law post graduation diploma and uh, he mba in strategy and leadership from isb talking uh, to him about the business of corporate management will be dr suma balan who is a pediatric rheumatologist rheumatologist at amrita institute and uh, along with him uh, along with her patta radhakrishna and me also will be quizzing chandrashekar ramurthy and we have a few other friends who will be joining in um, over to you suma Hi Chandra it's uh, really good to have you here and uh, you know today we are going to discuss things slightly different from what we usually discuss about um this thing so Chandra and I are active friends on Facebook where we discuss a lot of things but uh, we'll kick off with actually why don't you tell us a bit more about your journey so far and then we can meander on about the other things if if i if i start with the mbbs time in jipma ma'am uh, you know like my my sister was from the 92 batch jipma she's a dr sobar nikash is a uh, gynecologist uh, so is my brother in law he's a pediatric surgeon again from jipma the family of uh, jipma rights um i was not too keen on uh, doing medicine when i was in school in uh, pondicherry i had i always wanted to do engineering but we had this biology and maths the the way we are talking about dual qualification we had this option to choose medicine or engineering and i i secured the third rank in tamil nadu and pondicherry for in the engineering in the uh, state engineering exam so i had almost decided to take up uh, electronics communication engineering and pack and everything was ready and the jipmer results came in and i i was the uh, topper in the pondicherry category for uh, jipmer so then uh, there was a lot of brainwashing and people were like you must be mad to forego a seat in jipmer and then go for uh, engineering in chennai like don't even think about it no no one drops a jipmer seat just like just like that so then my inherent laziness has always uh, been at the forefront of whatever decisions i have taken it has been the background not the forefront my laziness pushed me into medicine because i didn't want to go to a, a hostel and wash my own clothes uh jipma means i could afford to be a day scholar and all uh, notes books everything from from my sister so that that was the main reason i thought like okay let let us do mbbs fine then i came into mbbs i started liking the subjects anatomy especially with dr batmanabhan and all I, uh, he was a great inspiration and of of the first year subjects for anatomy i i, I was one person in the class who read seven textbooks including including gray's anatomy so i was i developed sort of an interest and uh went through the mbbs of course the performance started dipping towards the final year because a lot of lot of extra curricular activities were also there and i ended up as the best all round outgoing student of the batch wow. if if i had continued the performance of the first year it would have been best outgoing uh but then uh, slowly other colorful activities came in and then ended up being coming to the all rounder side then the tough part started how surgeon came into first medicine posting then they say alternate days is like floor duty alternate days is like er duty and drawing blood samples running to the lab blood bank 
I thought, okay, this is not for me. Then surgery came. Surgery, anesthesia, or to all those things. I didn't even like to change into scrubs and go into the theater. <laughs> so all the surgical specialties were ruled out. Then pediatrics. It was very difficult to deal with the kids starting IV lines on them. So that also go was, was gone. And then here I was. I was very good in subjects. I knew I could crack any entrance and get a seat, but I simply didn't know what to do. So then I thought maybe I'd have stuck to engineering only and I wasted on a MBBS seat and also a career be barbat kar diya. So I, I was thinking and then came the optional posting at the end of internship. The last one month was radiology. That was neatly cut out for me, I thought. It, it, all, all the rooms were air conditioned, if not for the personnel, for the equipment. We had ACs everywhere. And the radiology PG did not have to move his ass out of the seat. The other department guys, senior residents, profs used to come and uh, request them for like, please, please, can you can you show me these images and all that. And all the work was, it was like mathematics. Whatever we read in the books, we could straight away apply on the diagnosis. So everything looked good for me. And then I decided now it's going to be radiology. But the problem was, there was only one seat in JIPMA. And I just had two more months because March, the entrance was there. So I did a marathon effort and managed to get, get that uh, radiology in the, um, uh, in, in fact, I got it in the All India quota for the JIPMA, went into radiology. I did enjoy radiology, though it, was, it, it wasn't a great department in JIPMA vis-a-vis uh, -vis uh, uh, some of the other central institutions, but it was, it was good enough. And my seniors, uh, Dr. Rajesh, Dr. Surabhi, um, they taught me a lot and I came out of uh, radiology in 2004. Then uh, by that time, uh, my fiancée, who oh, was a love marriage, and she was in Hyderabad. Three years al already we were, uh, I was in Pondicherry and she was in Hyderabad. Then I decided Hyderabad is the place to come after MD. So I came into Hyderabad and then this new hospital was uh, coming up near our house. That is the Ashwakala Hospital in Secretariat. So I went and joined there as a registrar in uh, radiology. And after that, it all the journey was shaped by Dr. G. S. Rao, the managing director of Ishta Group, who was also my mentor. So he saw me as a young radiologist, as a registrar. Then when I went for my fellowship to Nizam's for one year and came back, he told me, you are now an accomplished radiologist. Why don't you go and head our department in one of the hospitals? So that was the Malakpet uh, branch of Ishta. So I went as a radiology HOD and uh, uh, I, I, I was just... Uh, 20, 27 years old that time. So in another two years, uh, he asked me to take up the HOD of radiology of the Ashoda group. So that time we had 32 full-time radiologists working under me and I was not even 30 years of age. So I, I, I just started thinking again, like what is going to happen when I am 35 and I am 40, when I already reached the peak in a big corporate hospital in a big metro city. So the other two options which followed was, one was to do FRCR or write the USMLE and go abroad. And then again, the laziness came in. There was no way. It was it was like an, it was going to be like an extended hostel life. You have to shovel the snow and, and again, same, go and uh, launder the clothes and all that, that, cook our own food. This was just not going to work for me. I had to be in India where I can afford to be lazy. That was the first thing. Second is entrepreneurship to start off uh, own uh, radiology center. And again, that would, that that meant a lot of hard work. I, I, I would say that working for someone else was much, much easier compared to starting a venture of the own. So I was basically these two options dried out. Then again, I had a chat with my mentor. I asked him the same question, what do you think? So he told me, why don't you go and get formally trained in management because you are, you are the chief of a huge department get a formal training, I'll give you one whole hospital to run. So initially I thought he was joking, but I exactly, I took that decision in a week, wrote my uh, GMAT, went for the interview to Indian School of Business, which fortunately was in Hyderabad itself. I got through and I came back from my MBA as the chief operating officer of one of the Ashoda hospitals. So he kept his word and gave me that. Almost uh, three years I was there in that hospital. Then I came as the CEO of the bigger, the flagship uh, hospital of uh, Keshada that is in Secunderabad, which was a 700 bed hospital. Two years I did that. And after that, again, same every, every five year, like a five year cycle, I get bored. 
so i was again like running the hospital was also uh, getting chandrasekhar i think uh, we are fast forwarding we will come to those things step by yeah. step now yes, uh, you been a radiologist and then you became an administrator how did your radiology training help you being an administrator how was your medical background help you as an administrator were you different from the regular non medical administrators definitely sir definitely the non the non medical administrators i i encountered were of two types which you would also know one is the senior the the 60 plus uh, uh, gray haired mbbs doctor or or a specialist who has come out of clinical practice and then they become the medical director of a place that is that is one school of administrators and the other is the mba non non medical background with a uh, management training or a business degree and they come into management both these had uh, uh, the inherent flaws i found the first one as very unadaptive to change initiatives were less from their side and it was it was being run in a more of a old school way and the non medical background mbas could never understand the needs or requirements of the doctors at most times everything they looked at was numbers and uh, revenue figures return on investment those those sort of things but as uh, you would very well know medical field and uh, if doctors, i can interrupt for a minute i'll get to shiv is. and if shiv's uh, hands or mouth are not tied or plastered he can comment on non medical administrators shiv you unmute yourself yeah yeah <laughs> i actually to be frank i shouldn't be answering these kind of questions <laughs> <laughs> we do actually we don't actually have um, uh, sort of uh, those kind of administrators in our setups and i haven't come across many of them uh, what it is it is actually i think uh, what chandra is saying is very true i mean um, most uh, administrators should actually have some background of uh, medical uh, training uh, to understand from where the doctors come in um but saying that most of our chief executives of nhs actually are actually non medical backgrounds and most of them actually have uh, some degree of like in finances or they are actually just uh, well uh, saying that there are some who do actually get promoted from other uh, areas and most of uh, you'll be surprised that they could be actually from a nursing background um in nhs there isn't any uh, sort of uh, uh, you know a decision making uh, at local levels okay it's day to day things uh, most of them are centrally uh, you know decided everything is uh, so uh, uh, you know uh, homogeneous you can actually say i mean uh, suma has been there as well so she actually uh, knows how nhs work and most of them actually work like that so <laughs> to be frank no i'm not a kind of person who could actually answer that question properly yeah. now if i can round up uh, the question how much of uh, love and affection is there between the nhs doctors and the administrators <laughs> um not much okay yeah it's uh, it, if you look at uh, the uh, like i said if you look at doctors as such they could actually work on their own they actually most of the times do not actually need management to be uh, sort of managing them right yeah uh, so it only comes to things like you know you need to actually have some resources but again the budget is usually fixed for each department every year so it is about actually saying that what you would you like to actually get for that uh, particular so if you need something new okay it's about making a good business plan and uh, putting it up so if your uh, business plan is good you will get it you need to actually uh, be able to justify why you need that and what uh, benefits that will bring to the department but uh, otherwise there is much back, back to you what were your responsibilities as a chief administrator the question is to me yes so so when i started off as the coo it was it was a complete units responsibility what we call as the pnl the profit and loss that is the revenue and the uh, expenses part of it as well as the daily running the operational aspects every every department 
that was there in the hospital, not only the clinical departments, but uh, the paraclinical, uh, nursing, quality, security, housekeeping, food and beverages, everything. So there was it, the buck stopped with me as the COO of that unit. And I was reporting directly to the board of directors. So and since we had three hospitals, there always used to be a comparison and competition between the three units of Eshada itself and then with the other competitor hospitals in the city. But I would say 30% was the operational aspects. 70% we used to focus on the PNL. We We had a general manager and other hierarchical uh, uh, people in the uh, operational side who used to take care of the respective departments. So I was more into adding specialities and specialists that had always been my core strength to expand the scope of clinical services, bring in the revenues and take care of branding and marketing departments. That was my uh, main responsibility as the head of the unit. Chandra, uh, talking of, um, you know, you said how much clinical work did you did you have did you still do some clinical work when you shifted career no not no. at all okay. totally it, 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 it's like riding two, two horses and yeah. will not be able to do justice to either okay and do you miss that do you miss the... uh, yes and no not not the general uh, complete radiology aspect but i was very interested in diagnostic neuroradiology so that is one thing when I've discussed with uh, Dr. Anand or my friend, Dr. Ravi Suman. So that discussions on what what uh, what what sort of pathology this could be. Is it a tumor? Is it an inflammation? If if yes, what is the pathological diagnosis? And then to wait for the uh, post-op uh, findings and the last histopath report and correlate with that. That is a kick which I'm missing, but not not much with the other aspects of radiology. And my wife happens to be a radiologist, so I think there's enough of radiology in the house. The radiology is a very cushy job, right? Nine to five. Uh, no emergencies as such. And with this uh, uh, communication networks, you can do anything from home. But I, you have fallen or got onto a very hot seat where you should be available. Your advices should be available around the clock. Didn't you feel fish out of water or sitting on a burner? It I think it depends on the aptitude and the attitude. I'd always been more of on the ext extrovert side who wanted to talk to a lot of people, go to different places. So, or, or very practically, if I have to tell why I'm enjoying this more than that, two main reasons, I get paid four times uh, more than the chief of radiology in our hospital. That, that's a great reason. And the second is I've, in the last five years, I've been to 40 countries, four zero. When I was in my radiology, I had not I had not been to Nepal also. How how how, how can an administrator should be home all the time? How could you keep traveling? No, no, no. We 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 keep the traveling is an integral part, almost 10 days a month, 10 to 12 days a month. I'm and who runs I, I the travel. show in your absence. So that that's why we we interrupted you when travel? I was coming to that travel? part of that. How does travel help from you? 20, from 2015 onwards, I had come out of the hospital operations and gone into a complete business development role at a group level. So initially I was doing one unit's operations. Then I moved into a group and my scope came only to business development. And that is exactly what I'm doing now with the Kim's group also at a group level. I take care of increasing the uh, turnover of the company, profit max. How do you the, do the, it? The goal of where are business. you now actually? Shandro, where are you now? Sir, now I'm in second remote, sir. The, the, the same place where you visited us. Okay, but I thought uh, they, they had left there and then. In, yes, yes. I, I, no, I, I, I thought you were asking my current location. I'm, I'm working for Kim's place. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. You left Yashoda, that's what I heard. Yes, yes, left Yashoda in April uh, 2020. Uh, okay, uh, Chandra, there's a question from Facebook. Nitin Manohar is asking you. Uh, you always had a great vision for finding quality consultants. What do you look for and how do you decide whom to get on board? I want to know this. Nitin Manohar. That's, that's sort of a, a trade secret, but I'll, I'll reveal a, just out of experience. There's like for, for each specialty and requirement, obviously it's going to be, it's going to be different. But generally we, we look at people who we find that in the next five to 10 years, they are going to add value to the 
organization value in terms it's not only monetary okay, i'm not at all talking about monetary terms it could be something different for for instance i would say when when dr anand bal subramaniam when we took him into ashoda uh, we got in something called an intraoperative mri which in the, in the entire country there were only a couple of installations or maybe only one installation so he wanted to come and we promised him that we'll get him an intraoperative mri not look into the cost it is some eight or 10 crores of investment but we got that and we got him in and the neurosurgery department of ashoda just grew by uh, several notches whether the intraop mr yielded lot of uh, revenue to us that is a very uh, debatable question so i think still me uh, ashoda management and dr will not uh, dr anand will not be in sync uh, uh, with the answer for that question but in terms of reputation of the department it it grew up uh, it, it went up by manifold so we look at the person's uh, attitude we look at a person's training um always uh, uh, if 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 someone is from uh, central institutions i do give little more value to it um especially from uh, say sanjay gandhi or uh, pgi mar aims um cmc jipma this these places that the work culture which comes it, it guarantees guarantees up to 80% of uh, success in in uh, any corporate career because these people come with a set of skills and built in values uh, nitin himself would know that being a Uh, uh being trained from uh, nimans which is uh, the premier institute for his specialty so that is the training and the place of training and the level of skills is one thing which we see and communication today it's like uh, equally important to the skills if not more it's at least equally as important to the patient when when we are taking in a clinician we want somebody who will communicate well with the patient who will communicate well with the family who will communicate well with his uh, peers and uh, colleagues so basically these are these are the aspects which we look into it and we we always look at somebody who has a long term plan when when my, when i'm looking to take in someone for a hospital in hyderabad i should be reasonably sure for the next 5 10 years that person is going to stay put in hyderabad there is no point in taking someone and uh, trying to develop the department with them and in one or two years if the person jumps to another hospital for uh, whatever be the reason it it is it, it is a dent for the organization and again we'll have to start at square one so longevity is another thing which we look at when when we interview or interact with the prospective consultant and the, uh, the same question you must be also having had to uh, recruit people from who are trained abroad how do you assess training abroad uh most of the time the people whom i have recruited uh, abroad is from the uk only very rarely the us people unless there are strong personal uh, uh, compelling reasons i do not see specialists from the us too many coming uh, coming back to india but from the uk quite a few and in fact uh, dr shok mar singh also i met him a uh, couple of years back in the in the uk in our uh, alumni uh, meet at liverpool so every year i used to go to the uk and visit all the major centers and and uh, look at prospective people who are coming back nhs training i i would say it was it was it is very good in uh, some specialties training wise I, i i think it's good in most specialties uh, but the competitive nature which is there in india is not there in the nhs because there is there are a lot of patients it, it you you just have to come and do your uh, clinical part of the work in india it is different in india you have to start with soliciting patients and then comes the part of giving a good service to the patient so in this soliciting patients part many times i have seen some clinicians who uh, who are trained in the nhs they do not uh, cope up with it or um, they do not come to terms with it. It, it 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 cannot be told as a criticism but i would say it's culturally different and and sometimes there is there is an issue with that and i have seen people having uh, issues with the seven day work week so yeah <clears throat> i think that uh, comes with the question of ethics and um, one of the things chandra is i think uh, with nhs i think uh, uh, you know uh, the reason why probably people would uh, love to come back is that uh, maybe it's the money because in nhs uh, uh, everybody gets paid almost the same Uh, there is more time and uh, less money uh, 
And he said, uh, soliciting patient, because there is a lot of ethics involved. Even though people in UK tend to actually work by protocols, by guidelines. So there's guidelines for everything. And uh, they don't actually, because the patients, I mean, nobody's paying for uh, their care. They, they don't have to spend anything. Uh, so I think uh, that comes to the question of ethics. How do you actually ensure ethics within the corporate? I mean, this kind of setup where you actually have people, you did say you try to get the best it, it people. Ethics, it, ethics is a very gray area. So if I tell uh, in wherever I've worked, it's, it's, it's been 100%, uh, uh, there has been no ethical uh, violation or dilemma, then that would be a, that would be an outright lie. And I think that will apply for most of the corporate hospitals in India. So it is, it is a gray zone. And as long as we don't come into the red, I, uh, my conscience should be clear. As we, as we say, the utilitarian and Kantian cost, uh, concepts in philosophy. For, for the greater good, if you are able to uh, have some deviations, I think that is okay with me as a person. And that is how I've been uh, uh, doing things with the management. If we try to be too straight and protocolized, like we just don't want to break one single rule, then practically it becomes very difficult to run the show here in India. That's I'll ask you a few sensitive questions, uh, Chandra, please don't mind. Uh, sure. you, you are starting, a, uh, taken in charge of a new hospital and you have to select a cardiologist. In any city, uh, there'll be four or five renowned cardiologists, well settled, well entrenched, and you have to get one of them. How do you get them? How do this you get is them? A, basically con consultant recruitment when it comes to getting people who have practice. So this is a classic situation where this the job seeker is not at a at a lower uh, platform if 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 i may say the the job giver is at the uh, end uh, end where he is asking someone to come is it that the case all the time not all the time sir when 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 we are look we we uh, we get a lot of applications from uh, people who have just passed out or yeah, i'm talking people. about uh, you know the top level yes yes when it, when it comes to the cream, when we want a consultant who's going to immediately have a value add from day one, then we are at a lower platform. So it becomes a job of a salesman. So I will have to sell my organization and that role to him. So one of the sales pitch could be a better financial offer. It could be, but it doesn't work with everyone all the time. So... Second is, as I told about the interop MR or something like, we can, we can talk about some infrastructural uh, addition, which we can do for the consultant, which he is not having in the uh, place where he's working in. Third is, some people prefer a department system with uh, residents and assistants, associates, registrars. They like to be like a HOD in, in how, it, how they were in a government organization with, with a big team. So the team is something which um, excites some some people. So there, there are instances where we have created departments and teams and uh, recruited some people. But I would say half half the time it is it is for it, it is a, a very good financial uh, package and incentive system that um, motivates a jump. Um, mixture of reasons for the re remaining half. And the second question before the Suma takes again is why are juniors? trainee levels, resident registers, so badly treated by the corporate sector. They are neither given importance, they don't get promotions, and their salary is highly, highly negotiable. You know, it's so varied, there's no uniformity. Why do you, because, uh, I mean, you, do you agree with me about that point, about juniors I not agree. being treated? I would, I, would, I, would, I would agree partially, but then if, um, this is, as, as I said, this is, healthcare business, if you take out healthcare from it, this is like any other business which runs on demand and supply. So when you when, when, have when, you there, when there is any, a demand have you and it any possible way. less the person the, the the value graph falls steeply with when when they are more in supply and when the place is not too desperate and if, if you can if you can be replaced if, if they can afford to lose you then obviously the value graph uh, comes down. Probably that is the general philosophy that, that drives this sort of uh, 
uh, uh, less valuation or uh, paying less all that should stem from that only that is that is my thought process my might be have you, ch have you changed anything have you added any any value to this have you as a clinician or as a as a doctor because as a registrar you had felt something that you are not been given importance have you done anything to change it i i i done it for the radiology department but i would say i would say i could not extend it to the unit level because i was i was more concentrating on and on those four or five things which you said and this these were departments that were that were sort of in auto pilot mode being managed by other people i wouldn't say that i took some conscious effort to uh, revamp systems in 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 those departments suma so that's interesting and thank you for your honesty actually in uh, in these uh, comments now uh, dr girija sharma has a very interesting uh, question he says do you train consultants on communication skills we do not because basically i feel that there are certain things that cannot be taught soft skills is something which i believe can be taught when when you are say in your early 20s or something but most of our consultants are 30 plus this is something which which has to come naturally so i i do my homework and uh, uh, filter off the the poor communicators at the recruitment level it 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 it, it is it is an all or none thing and it it's in my personal opinion very difficult to teach vidya you can come in uh, <laughs> no i i was just uh, going to flip it totally other way see in all the facebook groups uh, like learning general surgery uh, the anesthetist the anesthetist society uh, most of the time i mean there is lot of uh, uh, you know we exchange lot of candid information but uh, common thread seems to be like you know that uh, corporate hospitals are some kind of villains like uh, I, I, i'll be you know um, sort of for want of a better word sarcastic to say that most people probably in india would actually like to work in a corporate hospital and uh, uh, work in good surroundings get paid well and all that but the general uh, feeling is of negative like as if uh, corporate hospitals are uh, just doing uh, bad things all the time so uh, why do you think even among doctors this perception is there first i think um, we fail to understand as doctors that uh, once it's a corporate hospital it's a business i mean it's a public limited company and if you were holding shares in some company you would want it to work do well you would want it to generate revenue you will want your dividend or whatever so what stops us doctors from understanding that you know uh, corporate hospitals don't advertise themselves as charity there is a you know there is a demand for, and for that you supply you you provide a service and for that you are um you know charging the patient i have also come across consultants who seem to think that you know hospital uh, when hospital charges it is overcharging but you know they should get paid like i have heard of even people saying that they would want 80% of the patients uh, Uh, final bill to be theirs or whatever those, that kind of thing so how do you handle these things i mean uh, it seems really uh, at least i have been working in a corporate hospital for 25 years i i like to think i have not compromised my ethics in any way uh, i i am not uh, you know minting money but i i am having a good life and i think i uh, uh, work pretty well so why is it how do you uh, sort of handle this negative image of corporate hospitals even sometimes for recruiting this is a it, it is a universal uh, phenomenon madam whatever you are talking in in simple terms i would say like uh, however caring or however nice you be a mother in law is always a mother in law she will be looked down as a mother in law only never as a mother even if the person is extremely uh, caring so the the reputation precedes so like well management is always going to be seen that way and many instances my friends would know my close friends whom i recruit once they join and they they start of their thing in whether let it be ashada or kims i will always be the management guy to them and second will be the friend the first when i recruit i will be the friend first and then the uh, management guy management guy second so that is that is something which we have to live with and we have learned to live with and uh, uh, as as an extension i would say that partially 
what uh, Dr. Pata was asking also is true in a sense. Uh, leave alone the juniors and the registrars. I might be biased, but I have found three or four departments which in our Indian system should be given a little more uh, esteem or well, I'm not, even, not even talking about pay, but more respect. That is one is radiology, laboratory medicine, anesthesia and intensive care. The clinicians are always seen by the corporate hospitals as the revenue bringers. And these four or five departments that I mentioned are the ones that are seen as salary takers. They are seen as costs. These are seen as uh, revenue departments. So that sort of uh, bias is there. So that is that is something which uh, over the time I, I try to get in a little more privileges for uh, uh, these departments. And that, that was something which I did in the management time though though not for the registrars, but at least even at a consultant level, this difference was there and I've, I've tried to bring that up. But otherwise, between the clinician and the management, if, if I ask uh, any surgeon or a clinician from, let it be Ashada, let it be Kim's, and I ask them, how many patients do you get because of the hospital? How many patients do you get on your own? The answer range will be 90, 10 to 100, 0. I have not come across one doctor in all these 10 years. And I am talking about a sample size of close to 1,000 thousand doctors. I have not seen anyone telling 50-50. Half the time I get patients from the hospital, half the time I get my own patients. Or someone who's, uh, who tells like 20 patients, I get 80 patients, the hospital only gives me. But we have the statistics. We know that it is a big mix. There are people who get 100-0. There are people who get 0-100 also. And there are a lot of people who get 50-50. But you ask any of them, the answer range is always 90-10 to 100-0. So that is, these are, these are self-made biases, which will be there in uh, any walk of, uh, any, any industry, I think. We always think the management earns uh, more money and then the uh, employee feels is, is little uh, less taken care of. It's more so in India and more so in healthcare industry. Uh, I don't dash. Uh, you get ready with your question, but before that, I'll again comment uh, uh, what Nitin Manohar has said. I think he's a great fan of yours, and he says uh, you've been one of the best administrators, and you have established some very good departments in Hyderabad, and you brought so many revolutionary changes. What are those changes? Uh, let us know, because we want to know what management really bring, what sort of changes they do really bring. Sir, organ transplant has been very close to my heart, and I've, I've, I've really done a lot with, with Teshoda and now with Kim's. Like for instance, when I changed from Eshada to Kim's, uh, the whole of oh, was it bringing more money? Uh, revenue, yes, it brings in, but but I would say the highest revenue earning departments are still uh, uh, the general medicine and uh, cardiac sciences. Transplant will be third or fourth on the list. So it's 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 not just about revenue, but transplants is something very few people do. So this is this is a differentiator. When when a hospital does transplant then we, we we can tell that we are we are doing most other things effortlessly that is how i put it because this is it is not it is not something to do with skills rather it is something to do with vision and administration and teamwork transplant is equal to teamwork right right from the uh, department of security to the housekeeping till the top most the hod the surgeon or the hepatologist or the lung transplant or the heart transplant physician, everybody has to contribute and any error anywhere can lead to catastrophic results. So transplant is something which, which speaks volumes about a hospital. If a hospital is doing good number of transplants, I feel that that, that, is, a, that is a hospital with a certain standard of uh, uh, care and uh, quality. So when I joined Kim's in the in the whole year, uh, 2020, in the last six months, we had done two trans two liver transplants. Now in the last three months, we have done 30, 30. This is the complete revamp of the team and all that. And then the heart and lung transplant team from Chennai, Dr. Sandeep Patavar and co, they joined six months ago and they are doing 10 heart lung transplants every month. Great. Two or three heart transplants, seven or eight lung transplants. So it is it is like a hospital within a hospital. If they, they are self-sufficient and almost every department, including administration side, there is a hierarchy of a chief administrator and two junior administrators only for the heart lung transplant department. So that is something which in, in, in Yashoda, uh, Yashoda Hospital was known in Hyderabad, in Telangana and 
some of the neighboring states, but it was never known all through the country. But once we started doing liver transplants in the second year of the liver transplant program, we crossed 100 liver transplants, which was one of the fastest in terms of history of any transplant program. So then Yashoda's name was known in Delhi, in Chandigarh, when I went, okay, I think you have a good uh, liver transplant team. We have heard about you. So that sort of presence in the national map is definitely due to transplants. And with the way we are doing heart lung transplants, we'll soon, PIMS will definitely be on the uh, international map. There's one of the biggest lung transplant programs in the, in the continent, not just in the country. So that is, yeah. that is one thing which I, I relish and I always have it very close to my heart. Dr. Dash, yeah, please unmute and ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Somru, yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, there are nice, interesting points which have been put forward. One of the things what I felt is somebody asked that, you know, corporates are, you know, money-making machines and, you know, finally it's working on a business model. But one question I'm asking to all the people here, Madam, I am running a, I'm running a very small hospital here. But fortunately, I'm the highest taxpayer in Pondicherry. Okay. The thing is, when you are successful, almost right now, half of my income is going to the government. How can you call as a profit-making organization? Okay, this question is addressed to who? To everybody, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, I think it, no, the point Dash is making is as long as you pay your taxes... Uh, it's not it's not a crime to keep earning higher and higher and uh, try to earn higher because anyway you are contributing to the society also yes you are working you are working 365 days a year and 180 days you are working for the government actually i am a government servant 180 days a year so that's where the things are wrong isn't it why why are you working 365 days a year <laughs> <laughs> Everybody need to actually you need to actually have a look at your work life balance is very very no important. no 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 sir no sir you no, just got no. the yeah you just got the thing wrong no no, no, no I will tell you it was it was a rhetoric so no, no, no. Dash, you you are, you are not only increasing the taxes you are also increasing the country's population yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually Doctor Dash no, your uh, uh, sorry sorry yeah what no, that, I understand I understand the concept of corruption and corporates and all that because there are there are, there are cases of tax evasions and stuff like that but if a person you know if a person is paying a corporate is paying the taxes honestly and giving the contribution to the government whatever it is due hmm. uh, then i don't know why there should be so much of a hatred uh, towards uh, corporates that they're making money finally the money what they're making a part of it is a major part of it is going to the government. And I don't same thing, same thing. Just, just, just an analogy I'm telling. Uh, today, there was some big uh, uh, hue and cry about, you know, people who are making profit out of Bitcoin. And hmm. Bitcoin should be banned in India. Person <laughs> who is making revenue out of Bitcoin, he is giving almost 40% of it to the government. So why should government, you know, really ban this, ban this kind of a thing? Anyway, uh, I think we'll move on from this. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. I think uh, I think that's a concept about that just because you pay taxes, uh, you are okay, uh, is I think wrong. Uh, there's a lot of other things involved uh, in uh, the whole concept. And like I said, one of the things is about ethics. Uh, now, uh, one thing, Chandra, I mean, you were talking about how you cannot actually train uh, people uh, in how to communicate. Actually, that's not actually very true. Everybody actually as, as doctors, we tend to learn throughout our life. And so can soft skill be also be taught. It's not that common taught. One of the things with uh, my experience with corporate has been uh, as a patient's relative. And uh, I'm not going to tell which hospital it was. And it was uh, my uh, uncle, brother, uh, dad's younger brother. And I can tell you he was treated by one of the top surgeons. And uh, I was in the room, a whole entourage came in, like you said, they love that. 
you know, they were like, uh, you know, whole, uh, it's like a comet's tail, but not at a single moment. My dad's uh, brother, he was a scientist for the, uh, yeah, you know, defenses. He's worked with President Abdul Kalam in the missile program, a very intelligent guy. He did not even speak a single word, right? And my uncle was, he was very understanding, he said. So that's where the problem comes, right? You're not communicating well, clearly with the patient. You need to actually, that is lacking. That's where I think the doctors from UK, actually, they are taught. Here we say that uh, the uh, doctor who is trained in UK, I mean, especially doing the, you know, basic degree and coming up, they may not know how to diagnose a disease, but they can communicate bad news to the patient very well. Okay. Yeah. I think that is the crux of the thing. It's not about that you're paying taxes. It is about how you actually communicate with the patient and their families. That's the thing. Yeah, we'll, so, we'll, well, good there point. Uh, I, that's, to... that's, uh, I think that's a bit of a controversial point, what you're saying. We'll, we'll get back to the No, 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 no. It's not yeah. controversial, sir. Yeah. It's about communication, communication skills. Okay. 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 A simple thing I just want to tell you. Communication skills in the corporates are even better than what it is in the UK. In an Indian corporate, if you have to convince a patient to do something, to do a procedure, let it be a liver transplant, a heart transplant, let it be an IVF procedure, your communication levels have to be supreme, way much better than what you have to do at the NHS. Oh, wait, wait, no, 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 no. You are getting it wrong, Dr. That. You are actually now talking about the unethical part of it that you are able to communicate and make sure that the patient needs, you can scare a patient to actually have an operation which he doesn't need. That's a big concept about in, in, in NHS because nobody pays for anything. There is actually, as I said, do the patient need certain operations? That's a different thing. You may be able to convince them. You might be a very good communicator in actually saying that, okay, I will likely do a case because you can scare them shit out of them and say, you need a surgery, otherwise you won't live. That's a different thing. I'm talking about what happens during this process. After the operation is done, what is going to be their outcome? How are they going to actually get better? How are they going to actually lead the rest of their life? That is what communication. Does the, does, does the wife actually knows that how long is the husband going to leave after a cancer operation? That is a, the communication. I'm not talking about communication, how you can actually get patient to actually have an operation. Yes, you can actually do that by fear and scare. Shiv, that's exactly what I was trying to say, uh, say that the perception is as if in corporate hospitals or uh, day and night, only thing we do is uh, do operations that are not required. That's so wrong. Yes. So, I mean, uh, I mean, that's... Uh, uh, that's Vidya, that's I think uh, this, this is not a point of our discussion. Uh, I think this requires a separate discussion altogether. I, I would request Dr. Girijadar Sharma to come in and say a few words. And before he comes in, uh, I'll get back to the mainstream, Dr. Chandra. Uh, next question is, uh, do doctors need to know about finances? Because we know no mathematics and uh, nothing is transparent to us. It may be transparent to you, but what you are paying me, what are earning out of me and how much you're keeping and whether you're doing this, I do not know. We in our experience have always been uh, uh, giving encouragement to doctors to come to us periodically and sit with us and discuss precisely what you are telling. How much have I earned? How much revenue have I earned for the hospital? What could be done better? This sort of financial understanding is very, very, very important for the doctors than someone who just says, I just don't know if the patient is there. Like I'm, I'm going to see the patients. I don't care. You just give me the check. I'll just keep it in my pocket and go and drop it in the bank. The understanding of the finances is very, very important. They're, they're, they need not cross any ethical boundaries with, well within the ethical boundaries. There is a lot of scope to uh, earn if once, once you are good with the patients, as uh, Dr. Shiv said, if you're going to be uh, communicative enough, I'm sure that uh, there's no dearth of uh, practice or patience for people who are good at it, but a basic financial understanding, including what, what somebody is taking home is, is something get, getting missed. There have been several instances where uh, someone who keeps track of his earnings has come to us and asked, I did not get paid for this particular case. And then we look into it. 
it would have been an overlook from the accounts department or the or the payroll uh, audit departments so this is very important to have a basic knowledge of finances i would also extend and go on and say some to something which i am not well trained in that is this uh, stock market and all those things uh, we, we see our uh, engineering colleagues by the by the time they are in their second year or third year uh, engineering they they all have the smartphones and they're they're on the stock market all the time doctors are very poor in it if, if if at all they have they have a lot of cash at home or they invest it in some real estate or something but uh, stock market is, is is something which which again it it it, it gives us it, it it's not just about making money but i think that is that is a field totally which which uh, many doctors keep away from but that will also give a lot of understanding on what 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 money is about and what the market is about i think we should actively actively go into that side suma yeah chandra um one thing i wanted to ask is with see from a doctor's perspective we do find it more comfortable to deal with managers when they have a, a medical doctor background from a manager's perspective like the people who own hospitals do they see a difference in having managers who are from a medical background as opposed to managers without a medical background absolutely the the thing is changing now most most of the big corporates are preferring uh, people with the uh, dual degrees both a medical degree as well as a business qualification and, and not just uh, one of them that is definitely there and as an extension i would all, all also say that radiology was a distinct advantage because we we know something of everything i i can speak to a cardiac surgeon i can speak to a pediatric rheumatologist i can speak to the uh, anesthetist in nhs or at the, the muller hospital or to the surgeon so we we know a bit of everything and another advantage i would say for administrators to come from the departments which i mentioned the radiology or the lab medicine icu and anesthesia because we are used to working in a department system a clinician in a corporate generally does not work in a department system it, he he is the uh, fulcrum there and it is only support systems and uh, junior people around him whereas a radiologist or an intensivist comes from a departmental background where there is a hierarchy where there is the, the different levels and uh, uh, hod who who puts the duty rosters and and the offs and uh, the, the increments all these things works as a small department so when we come from a department background it is easy to manage people and extend it to the hospital compared to a clinician who comes from more of a uh, self centered environmental background and nalla wants to come in yeah Allah will have a lot of insights. Yes. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Nice to be part of the team. Well, um, just to say that I have been always working. After I left Jipma, I've been only in corporate hospitals, and I would absolutely like to make two points clear. When I joined the Aster, which is Aster Hospitals, is what is there in India. We call it as Medcare, and the owner was Azad Mupan. when i took over as a medical director and we started this uh, uh, the hospital 15 years back in dubai 18 years back the first point i made to him was one thing i said don't just differentiate the the surgeons physicians and put away the backbone of the hospital the anesthetist the pathologist the radiologist and please do not differentiate them as salary paid doctors so from day one we always brought in a scheme the doctors have to be given their importance so we had a fees that was paid for every service that was delivered by each one of us now these fees were in par with the surgeons or or with whatever it is like i used to charge 30% of the surgeons fees if it's a normal case if it's a high risk case we used to charge even 40 to 50% of the surgeons fee now this fees is always collected and it will be called as the department income and the department income is always made as a in the end of the month and we have a target and then we have the incentive scheme a salary is something that is paid to you because you are working for the hospital on your qualification and your uh, ability but the productivity of you as your ability and your a uh, productivity becomes more and when the income becomes more 
then we call it as incentive scheme. So beyond a particular target, we used to call it as incentives. Now, when you work for incentives, I would like to let people know that we are not going to be unethical. As an anesthetist, you can, you can see we have a scheme, we have something called as we, we, we attract doctors, we attract surgeons to come and operate here. They are not part of the hospital at all. So we call them as visiting surgeons. So the more the visiting surgeons who come, so if you provide a good service, which is with my team, and then when I make a productivity which is more, and the income to the hospital, obviously all that is translated as incentive, which is divided to the entire department based on the seniority. The head of the department gets a bit of it, and uh, the following down the line, depending on 10-year service, five-year service. So I always considered that we should never leave the supporting department just to say that, oh, you guys are just you know on the backstage, and so you will be paid a salary. The other point I wanted to say was what Chandrasekhar was telling, it's not always transplant and transplant that makes the hospital more fabulous and income generating, no. Even every other part of surgery, if you can deliver it in the right way you and do, the, do a quality service, you are going to be successful. And to be honest, let me tell you, in my hospital for 15 years, my chairman has always said the anesthesia department is the pillar of the hospital. And I've been always been proud of it. The radiology department has been the pillar of the hospital. The surgeons may come, they have their own, like he said, 90% of the surgeons say it's because of me, or sometimes they say the hospital. But true, what happens over a period of time is when the corporate setup grows, when they are in the growing phase, they look at you. After they have grown, then that's where the problem comes in. At 15 years, 20 years down the growth, then they say, come on, Apollo is Apollo, Medcare is Medcare. We don't need Vidya, we don't need Nala, we, we can run it without all of you. So that's where you need to make yourself established more. And that's where as doctors, we fail. We try to feel humiliated. We feel that, oh, we are, I think, you know, I will leave you and go. No, even there, you can still stand and let them understand that, listen, after all these years, we have built it up. We still have to carry on. So I think, you know, there is always a balance and corporate setup, it doesn't mean it's unethical and things like that. Yeah, it is a profit. It's for it, all of these are for profit organizations and we all pay taxes, whatever it is. But if we do a good quality service, I think all the service departments like Dr. Chandrasekhar was telling should be appreciated. They should be given incentives. You should motivate your uh, team. You should, we have a lot of other schemes that go on. In fact, none of my uh, employees work for the salary. And it's not only me, it's only even the nurses and the technicians. It not goes only with the doctors. All my nurses, technicians, if they get a salary of 10,000, they take another 20 to 30% more as every month as incentives because they stay back. If I tell them to work after five o'clock, continue the case till 10 night, they will happily do it. So unless you have an incentive scheme, end of the day, I think it's not money, but still money matters. And with money and then quality, I think corporate setup is has, has grown in a big way only with, the, with all this additional, with this support of all these departments. But, I, I, but we should not let, let the corporate to take over you at some point of time. And I think we should keep your ability to keep your uh, your, uh, your your the level of what you have worked for that organization, understand and keep it always emphasized. And we should take an opportunity at every year when you get a chance, let them know that it's because of you. There's nothing wrong. And there's nothing wrong if you're going to blow your trumpet. There's nothing wrong about it. I just wanted to share that. <laughs> excellent, excellent points, uh, Dr. Nala. Just to just to add one of my experiences on, on incentives, what I was talking, how uh, incentives helped me manage the situation was in uh, 2011, we had this dengue epidemic. And uh, I was at the, I was the CEO of uh, Yashoda Malakpet, which was a 350 bedded hospital. The hospital was running 100% full. And for a solid two months, 
continuously 60 days every day we were sending back 10 patients because we didn't have beds we had the manpower to treat but we were just running short of beds so i came up with an idea i called my management the admin team i had a chief medical administrators two deputy medical superintendents and uh, head of operations and the head of hr and we had a core team the nursing superintendent so for two months we decided to use the library as our office and we freed up seven of our rooms i also gave up my my cabin as to stand as an example so with seven rooms for 60 days the hospital made an additional income of close to a crore of rupees 1 to 1.2 crore rupees and all of us took some a couple of lakhs as an incentive the hospital was very happy to give us that only thing one of my administrators came and told me like i'll, I'll surrender my room permanently increase my salary but <laughs> i couldn't do that obviously Chandra, if i can ask you another sensitive question why people of equal experience and qualification are paid differently in corporate sector why there's no uniformity why there's no standardization sir, when answer, will it be done? answer is there in the question sir experience and qualification is not equal to 100 experience and qualification is equal to 70 there is another 30 or i want to gitanjali to come in here if she can unmute and come and comment on what has happened till now dr gitanjali yeah carry on chandra and and since like you you are you're calling the right person to since madam is there i would say the things work very very differently uh, in the government uh, sector and if you ask me personally where it is more difficult to be at the top it is 10 times more difficult in the government getting things is it, done is it true is madam very difficult in the government i have a free hand in the corporate there they are chained and still they have to run uh, i don't I, know. I, I can i can fire anyone at at will today today i can think this person is not performing and tomorrow morning i can fire yeah, Adam cannot do that. Being the director of AIMS, she, I, I, I don't know if, if the, the, the protocol so has changed is, now, but I don't true think that just one of the one of the aspects, uh, and also even our procurement is uh, tied up so much. We've been trying to get a PET CT now for the past uh, three years, and we still have not a PET CT and a cyclotron, and we still not we have still not got it. So the, the tender has failed three times and this is the fourth time we have floated and things like that. So the, it, it is uh, a little difficult, but uh, thank you, Chandrasekhar. I enjoyed the discussion and all the mm -hmm. questions, but I have just one question for you, uh, which is, uh, of course, maybe because it, it has come up recently uh, in my hospital. Do you find a lot of, um, you know, jealousies between the consultants? For example, do you have a surgeon saying, you know, these kind of surgeries I should do, this person shouldn't do, or, uh, you know, uh, there is always a kind of, a, uh, what shall I say, someone wanting to, uh, you know, show themselves in good light and the other person in worse light, you know? Do you have that kind of a problem uh, in uh, your hospital? I'm just curious to know. Uh, I've, I've, I've seen it happen with some departments. It as as exception, I would I wouldn't uh, generalize it. I disagree with uh, you. You should be very frank here. Uh, <laughs> you should be very. Uh, I'm, I'm a surgeon in corporate sector for dogs years. Vidya is a, a, a witness to all these things happening. I, I this is not true. What you say? <laughs> what, every what I'm single individual, true? every single surgeon has this issue. In the corporate side, I, I, know, I, 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 I have seen it in exceptional cases. Maybe, maybe inside it might be there, but it doesn't get uh, get expressed outside in a lot of times. At least, I thought management least promotes this. Uh, not really, right. not really, <laughs> not really. That that, that, that we wouldn't, we wouldn't uh, working work working. Uh, uh, Deepak, uh, Deepak, you come in. Deepak, the harmonious in. atmosphere is definitely much more conducive to the hospital's revenues than this sort of, okay, there could be a sort of competition, but when it when it comes into outright jealousy, but having said that, I've seen extremes of situations. I've, I've, I have an instance of one neurosurgeon hitting another, hitting, <laughs> hitting physical. So even, even that has happened, like, like the other surgeons had to rush in and uh, uh, restrain them like, like in a boxing fight. Okay, so oh, it's not rare. I, I was thinking that it's, it's absurd for people 
who are so well educated, who are having all the, uh, you know, uh, the equipment, uh, the uh, instruments, the, uh, you know, the atmosphere to shine. And then they sit and, uh, you know, uh, fight with each other. So I was thinking it's rare, but now everyone is saying it seems to be very common everywhere. <laughs> very common, very it's common. common. This, this, surgeons, this surgeons are sometimes at the reception of the hospital with their own agents who direct the patient to their clinic. <laughs> of three, is there a four surgeon sitting in the thing? It happens. This is something that happens. It's not that Dubai. the administration doesn't know. It's not a like Dr. Pata said. It's not that, that the administration doesn't know, but at some point they make it convenient in such a way that end of the day corporate business has to grow. So this does happen. Definitely, it happens in every one, one, corporate. One instance of where it got physical was for a was for a medical management case. It was not a surgical case, also. <laughs> that yeah. it was at my admission day, and how did it go to you? Now, Chandra, you should understand that management is happy. Whoever is the uh, surgeon who's operating, or because I think even the money will come to the management kitty. They're happy as long as the surgeons and others fight each other and come to them for uh, judgment or help. I mean, this is the this is the convention. I, I'm surprised that you didn't see. I, I would look at happen. it. I would look at it as a positive side in my present organization in Kim's. We are uh, we have always been encouraging the department culture, where there is a HOD and there is a single team. In most of the departments, there is one team and there is no concept of second and third competitive units, which was which was how it was in all the 16 years when I worked with Ashoda. I think those are two different models. I found some advantages in the previous one too. I, I, I cannot outrightly dismiss that that was bad and this is good. But I do see a lot of advantages and, and uh, where we come from, I see better academics and better, uh, uh, a little bit better quality patient care when, when it is a uh, department system and not uh, internal competition within the same department. So regarding academics, uh, corporate sector gives very little importance to academics. If they think the doctors are wasting time, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, listening to lectures. Not, or even, not even very little importance. They give little importance. If, yeah. if, if the, what have you the, done the for that? And what is the solution? Little is equal to zero. Uh, uh, my, my mentor and boss used to say that we are a treating hospital, not a teaching hospital. Right. So those who want to learn as a byproduct, let them learn. But your focus should be on treating patients, not on teaching students. This was his philosophy. Again, I'm I'm no one to say whether it's right or wrong. He's a, he's a he's a big man himself. Who's like he's uh, running a 2000 bedded uh, hospital show. So it, it it is not it's not something which I can criticize. But he says that I've I've built this hospital to treat patients, and if academics happens side by side, so be it. But I, I, I wouldn't ask anyone to uh, focus much about it. Vijay, there are some questions in the chat yeah, box. No, Deepak, uh, Deepak is an uh, ex-colleague of mine, surgeon, and he's also done hospital management. So, And he's worked in corporate as well. So, Deepak, would you like to say something? Uh, sorry, I joined just 10 minutes back. Uh, I was a little held up. But yes, uh, I mean, I was just went through that discussion which you just had on uh, uh, the competition between the surgeons or rather people fighting. I think I think that's existent almost everywhere. And I, I mean, in my opinion, I think uh, especially in a hospital which is more than four or five years old, uh, I think that's when it starts to kick in because that's when the, the visiting consultants and other consultants of all departments start to come in. Uh, initially, it's usually only the, you know, the retainers who are there. Uh, so it, it's definitely there. At least in Chennai, I've seen it in like four or five corporates that I've gone across. So, yeah. But great discussion. Please continue. I'll, I'll, I'll be here. So, uh, the other thing I wanted to raise and somebody else has also raised that uh, everyone talks about corporate hospital as something bad. But actually, the uh, what is uh, profit for a corporate hospital is saving money for a, a non, not for profit. Uh, so, do you think some of these uh, so-called corporate culture should actually be imbibed in government and other uh, uh, smaller units to actually to uh, to make it more efficient? End of the day, uh, efficiency and uh, patient satisfaction should be the the target for any hospital, right? Corporate or non-corporate. Very much, madam. I think there has always been cross-learning from uh, different industries. We have learned. We, we learned about the, so for example, in radiology, uh, the turnaround times and all that were learned from the aviation industry. 
the checklists in the ot were learned from the aviation industry so when we are learning from some other industries why not from different sectors within the same industry and it should be it, it should be mutual there are a lot of things for the private sector also to imbibe from uh, the government in terms of uh, running a hospital and and vice versa I've, in fact i have been requesting gitanjali madam to invite me for a talk on uh, hospital management to aims and i keep doing it in some of the uh, other colleges in pondicherry but uh, madam is yet to call me to bhuvneshwar i'm i'm ready madam whenever you see yeah sure definitely uma yeah no there's a very very interesting question here uh, chandra dr aparna chandrashekaran is saying do you think private model for healthcare is principally flawed in public health care the patient doesn't have to pay in contrast the private hospital shells out significant cost on land buildings things like referral incentives bribes to government for licenses etc knowing that the patient bears this brunt does it not give an a certain undue pressure to earn revenue revenue over ethical and low cost care okay what is the the, the bottom line is there are so many uh, uh, costs involved which will get translated to the patient but how are we able to give this quality care at one tenth of the rates of the united states of america i think i think we we do an appendicitis or a cancer surgery in 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 any of the good corporate hospitals i think the quality is the same or at least 80 to 90% at one tenth of the costs so the country's model itself is different no in india Uh, so Chandra. it is difficult to call the private healthcare system alone as flawed we are delivering very affordable uh, uh, care if if i again can talk about my uh, core area that is uh, transplants uh, the cost of a liver transplant in uh, singapore is like seven times and in the us it is 12 times more than what we do in india and the success rates are similar it's not it's not that they have a 100% success rate and we have a 50% uh, mortality rate in liver transplant everywhere it is between 80 and 90% so if we can do that at 1/10th or 1/12th of their cost i think there are so many other countries which have to wake up and correct the flaws in the system if it is flawed uh, it could also be partly because uh, like you know your top surgeon in transplant might be paid well but many many people in the lower rungs of the chain are there uh, you know they come really cheap so that's one of the reasons why costs are being uh, probably costs are low it is everything cost the the max what are the maximum costs incurred by the hospital first is the hr the consultant payout is first and then the non consultant hr hr costs or the this the manpower cost is the number one cost in any hospital yes. second is only the consumables and uh, the pharmacy so obviously when the when the when the manpower is cheaper the costs are going to be less but due to various reasons we we are having a, a low cost model only i wouldn't say that uh, we we uh, tend to pressurize the patient and, and then again what is the government there for them they also have to provide uh, uh, all basic services if 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 not advanced the government has to it, it's the duty of the government to also provide healthcare as a, as an essential service and the private players should come in as uh someone who complements it but we know that in india it's like 80% is in the hands of the private and private care is disproportionately distributed if we go from a metro to a tier 2 we know the uh standard falls abruptly so these are only small pockets where a small percentage of the population is able to come and afford but that's how it works can i add a point with you yeah no i was trying to say that most of the advanced uh, treatments uh, in india have been driven by corporate probably started in uh, you know people used to go abroad to have a cabg before uh, uh, apollo came up so in that sense uh, uh, even transplant most of the uh, maybe one or two institutions might have in the non corporate sector might have actually driven a new program but otherwise all the cutting edge work uh, has happened only in the private sector in india so if it weren't for that it wouldn't be available at all so forget about at what cost it is it just won't be available at all so uh, till uh, the government sector is able to provide all the uh, facilities and the patients are willing to go and get the treatment so you know the 
in in india the problem is uh, though we say we are a poor country we don't have healthcare services but even my maid or or driver doesn't want to go to a government hospital to get treated there is some problem with the mindset so given that those who can afford if uh, you are providing a service uh, as long as it's ethical and it is a high quality uh, uh, i i don't see the conflict at all uh, absolutely i think uh, part madam of- i just wanted to make a point yeah sure sure madam the thing about what you told and what chandra told is very true today the government doesn't spend anything close to you know this year the budget they told that they are increasing the health spending because of the covid pandemic but the thing is it is nothing near what it should be actually in in developed countries what it is supposed to be it is it is nothing nowhere near to it so if if a person chooses to take treatment in a private hospital they have to pay that because government is not subsidizing anything because i am running a private hospital during the covid pandemic the government has not made any initiative to help us out of all this it is like you are left on your own you do whatever you want to at least a little bit you know we can we can take care of your electricity charges or something we were also suffering at that time the thing is here we are left on our own i mean a private institution is left on it and if we transfer the charges to the patient what chandra has told it is it's actually very 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 minuscule yeah labor comes cheap but that way then you should tell that if uh, our prime minister is telling that we should be atmanirbhar bharat so the person who is stitching your uh, your your clothes your undergarments everything he is also being paid very less labor as such is cheap in india it is cheap in to, vietnam to to extend this to extend this point there is also a question relevant question from uh, doc, i could see the question from dr deepak subramaniam again about insurance whether it, it is going to drive the future i think this is this is a lesson the covid pandemic has taught the people what uh, how many of the middle class population what percentage have taken health insurance is it because they cannot afford they will go and see the uh, uh, first day movie with family for 2000 rupees but will they pay that much premium annual oh, for a health insurance insurance concept so is that, is that not awareness going to work that, in india so, for the time being i feel the insurance concept is not going to work for the time being in india that it might it might take a few years for the it's, it's on the increasing in. trend and it has to increase further yeah. there has to be a, and a, a, as, a, as a, long as long the idealism exists that doctors the socialist ideology exists what was started after independence that doctors are only made to serve you should not expect money so why should we pay something for health insurance that concept for a large population to sink in for 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 that that you know health health it is supposed to be you know doctors are supposed to serve free doctors are supposed to do uh, as, doctor, as a matter doctor, of service actually dr deepak's question was a little different he was he is asking whether in insurance just like in us the insurance companies decide what treatment uh, who gets and for what cost and everything so i think he, what he means is insurance companies are they going to be Madam, but, private but they have to pay a premium right they have to pay a premium the concept of premium is not there no, why no, should we no, pay no, for to answer his question that that will take a long time to come because uh, the majority of the people should be covered with the health insurance and not be paying from their pocket it's so only then the power will shift to the insurance companies as it has happened in the us i don't see it happening in the next one or two decades at least in india uh, correct yes, it yes. is not going to happen in one or two decades and the second thing is the insurance companies what they try to you know the fine print what they do you know you do a procedure i, I am talking about some minor procedures or stuff like that and then you know they ask for so much of paperwork and stuff like that and finally they tell that oh this is not covered in the insurance you have not admitted the patient for a day so this will not be covered a simple procedure like a diagnostic laparoscopy where we you know do a procedure and uh, we discharge the patient the same day the insurance company tells that you know we can't uh, you know cover this under insurance because you know the patient was not admitted for a day uh, you don't need to admit actually a patient of diagnostic laparoscopy for a day that uh, thing and sometimes you know the patient is not willing you know they tell that you know you told us that it is only 6 uh, hour 7 hour stay 
so why should we get admitted uh, and just for the sake of you know claiming an insurance they tell us okay we don't want to claim the insurance we'll rather go back home uh, so these are things so this, this there is are a lot topic of fraud is a separate discussion yeah i think that time is fine okay chandra let's move on yeah chandra if i can come back to you uh, you've been a successful administrator till date what are the major challenges you face where are the areas which you think that you couldn't do much pediatric rheumatology <laughs> there is chandra i make a point we still don't have a trained pediatric rheumatologist in andhra pradesh or telangana is a crying shame okay like i was suma is willing i was uh, suma madam actually uh, trust me i was about to come to the same point not not specifically as pediatric rheumatology sir i think uh, the uh, super specialty and the niche specialty sub specialties are still seen by the corporates as an unwanted expenditure and not as an investment for the long term so i would say there some some sort of a short term uh, bias if we consider long term these are the areas where the uh, we have to encourage super specialists though the volumes will be less to start with so that is the reason why everyone wants to do everything they want general neurologists they want general rheumatologists they want general gastroenterologists but if we go for say pediatric sub specialties or in uh, neurology if we go for uh, 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 epilep- epilepsy and other disorders or uh, movement disorders so if we have expertise in sub specialties that is future that is what is happening in the west and slowly our country also has to go for if we have to uh, move forward in the scientific medical scientific arena we have to encourage sub specialists i think that is something where the corporates still can uh, uh, work a, think a lot about it. so that is having a long longer term view in the next 10 years and not just the uh, financial statements of the next one year, one financial year if we want to say something yeah um oh, sorry yeah so uh the two two points uh, first of all i wanted to ask about uh, what about corporate uh, social responsibility how have you incorporated that into your it's it's every, everyone does it everyone does it as a legal formality and as we as, as dash was talking about taxes and all that uh, even even in our in our mba course in the in the isp we had a case study on which there, there was a debate about what is corporate social responsibility yeah. it's another form of tax hmm. If 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 someone is responsible, they will do it. Like I I. Chandra, Chandra, one more thing, and and bribes also to the to the government officials. That is yeah, also yeah. one hey, of hey, the. Hey, Dash, you always bring is... difficult topics, yeah. Yes. No, 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 no. That is also, sir. One of the IAS officers, uh, he told me that uh, that is a part of your corporate social responsibility. Sir, 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 it is corporate, corporate, he, corporate, he, corporate he, anti-social he, responsibility he, and corporate social responsibility. He decorated the he decorated the word uh, bribe with uh, CSR. Oh uh, yeah, that's uh, absolutely amazing. The second second question I think is related to uh, you know how uh, you're saying that. Uh, in india the cost of certain operation as compared to us and uk are actually cheaper whereas if you look at uh, the, you know the uh, resources used uh, especially like disposables and stuff uh, and medicines but there is actually a cost difference even in them you know the same disposables are actually uh, cost different in uk and us as compared to in uh, india um uh, there is also um as you look at uh, i'm very interested in that uh, aspect uh, especially for nhs what i see is a lot of wastage right so that's one thing which drives the cost higher uh, the second thing is yes we talk about efficiency within the system uh if you uh, you won't believe it because i looked at it the cost of running a theater is 15 to 20 pounds per minute and in the nhs you can actually see people like is sitting in the coffee room waiting for a patient which probably won't happen in the corporate where people are actually running they don't like to waste a single minute okay. so you are utilizing that time very well people 
okay, at five o'clock, we will say, okay, this is the end of the day. Uh, but that wouldn't happen in your corporate setup. So you are actually utilizing the time much better. And, and that's why I think that the costs are much lower uh, as compared to uh, UK and US. And I think insurance also, I think insurance is not going to be the answer. Insurance might actually drive the cost higher uh, if you bring it in, in India. So uh, I think that Valid point. I think you have who, very... who, who, who has been in Jipmar uh, at my time, if I quote an example from radiology, they will know how difficult it was to get one CT scan brain done in the night. It was not mushkil nahi tha, na mumkin tha when I was there. It, it is just not possible. Yeah, it was not possible to get a CT after 10 p.m. Yes, yes. The the government hospitals are actually in India. Uh, I mean, I've worked, worked in Japan as well as at Ames. Uh, there is lots of inefficiencies within the system. You know, people will actually cancel a case saying, oh, is sodium is, uh, you know, it's not 135, it is 133. Bring it to 135, then I will take it to the theater. His blood pressure is actually not 120. It's, uh, you know, it is 140. So when it comes to 120, bring it to the theater. You know, the cancellation, they're not uh, looking at that how much amount of time. Uh, but I would actually know it, how it actually worked at Ames. You know, people find uh, excuses to actually cancel cases because they know they will be paid that money at the end of the month. Whether one surgeon does 10 cases or does 20 cases, it makes no difference. Where is Sir, that, that is where, yeah. excuse me if I just, that yeah. is where, like we were discussing earlier, you know, that is where this incentive system actually works. You know, you are, uh, uh, you know, you know, the doctor who was working with, uh, working in Dubai, he was telling that, you know, uh, if you, if you, if you, you are, you're paid a basic salary for your qualification and your time to the hospital. And the more you uh, render your services, the more you try to get in uh, patients, the more you uh, efficiently serve the hospital, you are given an incentive. I think, I think every human being works on an incentive basis. The entire problem of, other, of the government sector is lack of an incentive. You know, you work five hours a day also, you get the same salary. You just come, punch in your finger and go out also, you get the same salary. That is what is uh, the system that is, that is, that is what is the disease that is plaguing our government system. Uh, we are uh, not as responsible citizens as we uh, would like to be like, it was in like it is in Norway or Denmark or Finland, uh, but it's 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 just that it's just that you know uh, different different countries have to follow different medicines. So in India, it's a different system. That is that's all. You need the incentive system to you know get people working uh, to their best. I think we just to add, uh, Shiv Singh no was telling. Shiv Singh was telling. Even in Sir, UK. exactly. That's what I was. I was. Yeah. I agree even in Europe, saying, even in Europe, they have a huge waiting list. Yep. The primary reason is because they are not able to cover up with their uh, with the existing uh, existing staff and their working manpower. Now the waiting list. That's exactly where the corporate comes into place. Yeah. A private setup comes into place. And regarding the cost, what the NHS costs them for an hip replacement is what we charge in even in Dubai. So we have people who come on medical tourism. So the corporate system started evolving more and more only because of the inefficiency of the existing uh, government system. And it is not that because India has got less government system, the best of the government systems in Europe and US still have a huge waiting list. And still they are not able to cover up their waiting list. Despite having, like you said, Norway, Sweden, Germany, even NHSE must be telling they have there are the more than 20, 20 million bariatric patients waiting for a bariatric surgery. Just to add on to that, but we can just do it for the same cost price, nothing. So they just need to travel down. So that's where a corporate setup starts working up on models of what Chandrasekhar was telling. Either the cost of a transplant in his hospital is much, much lower than Singapore. Singapore and him may not be the, the, just a few, the distance is not much. But in terms of waiting lists, their waiting list is much higher. 
So the waiting list starts becoming more and more in all these places. And that's where corporate setups are trying to get on to this, uh, to get the benefit of that. So the, it's not unethical. It's not that we are becoming uh, cheap, but you provide a lengthier, you provide a longer service. We will still, I still do a sleeve gastrectomy at eight o'clock in the night. Hmm. It's, it's absurd. Somebody says that in the, in the NHS, they were telling, if you do an elective surgery at nine o'clock night, there can be an error and then it is not acceptable and it should not be done. That's not the fact. You have two teams. We have a team that works from eight to uh, four in the evening and there's another team that works from four to 12 in the night. So I think all these things have been putting these uh, European people telling that, no, no, if you do elective cases after four, there will be more uh, mishaps, there will be more uh, wrong things happening. And then they say they have a waiting list and the fellow dies with, the uh, CABG patient dies without having the surgery, waiting for his chance to get a cabbage done. Whereas in India, you just the next day you go to, if you leave Apollo, go to uh, Ramchandra or some other place, he'll get his cabbage done. Only thing he has to pay for it. Yeah. So end of the day, you get the treatment done. And, and I don't think you should uh, blame the corporate for doing this and then say that, okay, they may not be, they're doing it uh, in an unethical way or they're doing it in cheaper way or they're using something else like reusables are being used again, disposables are not appropriate. No, I think corporate setup has come up a long way now. Even in our hospital, we have, that's why we have the accreditation systems. All corporate hospitals go through proper accreditation the NBAH, the JCIA, and things like that. So we have reached a part to show the, in the government system that corporate systems have reached their level. They are also in par with us, and they are cost-effective. Only thing is, in terms of working, it's, it's purely that same point of incentivification. In LA, you work in the government, in NHS, you'll be paid the same salary, but then in a private setup in the same NHS, you get much more money if as an anesthetist per hour. So I think that that thing is not driven in the European system still. In India, it's much more. Middle East, we have a lot of it. Corporate has grown a lot and uh, private systems have not grown much, but they will grow up soon if the waiting list becomes more or we are going to tap all of that opportunity. <laughs> Just uh, to add that. Chandra, I have a question. Uh, you, have, you are a widely traveled health manager, right? How is private healthcare different elsewhere as compared to India? And what are the growth patterns you foresee in Indian private healthcare in the next decade? So the most most of the countries I've been to are the ones for medical tourism who are going to come to India. So, so I've, I, I've, I've, it, I've not traveled to the rich belt. The rich belt was on, on my personal money uh, on vacation to the US or uh, to Europe. Uh, I'm talking about Far East Asia and uh, the Sark countries and African countries where, uh, uh, like, for instance, the whole country of Zambia does, didn't have a cath lab. You don't have a cath lab. You, you, you need an angioplasty, you die. Or you survive by a miracle. They'll have to travel to Nairobi by flight to the next country to get a, a simple PTCA done. So that, this is the situation in uh, most of the places. And I was going to market uh, uh, neurosurgeries and... Uh, 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 multi-organ transplants and stuff. So that, that is something which uh, I don't think in the next next 10, 20 years also they are not going to uh, be up to that level. So there is a huge scope for uh, medical tourism in India. Uh, yes. Chandra, so in the, on the same line, so there are, uh, Dr. Praveen has asked, what are the skill sets we doctors need to acquire now to be future ready? So that follows on on the same question that RK asked to just now. I think as, as we discussed earlier, a little bit of financial understanding is very important. Many of us like, like, like we, we sort of like maths is not for me and we keep it out, but we should, we should get that in. I also uh, think um, learning an additional language is very, very important. Like if, if I go by my personal experience, the place where I come from down south, Hindi was a taboo and uh, most of the people used to learn only Tamil in school and some people used to learn French uh, being from Pondicherry, but uh, the Hindi section always used to be the smallest. So, but that time my, my, my grandmother was a PhD in Hindi, fortunately, and we had this uh, 
tele serial on wednesday and friday called buniyat so i wanted to understand and watch that buniyat the show so when i came from third standard to fourth standard i took up hindi as a second language so today i cannot imagine working in hyderabad without knowing hindi even without knowing telugu we can manage but uh, hindi as a hindi speak was very yeah. important for me so i think if we know uh, one or two more languages it's very good as a, as a as a doctor it, it helps you not not just as an administrator even as a clinician if you know a, a new language it's it's always helpful maybe uh, uh, dr nalla is in dubai i'm, I'm sure uh, the the local language uh, he would have learned it by now and that will be very useful to manage the team and the yes. staff so that is that is something which we can we can develop in our, in our free time okay and there is another very futuristic question here do you think ai is going to make a few branches of medicine redundant in the next 10 years and our, our hospital from a management perspective is it going to be very very different managing patient care it will it will never make any branch redundant it is always going to be complementary and further uh, develop that branch so radiology is one thing which is like very very uh closely linked to the artificial intelligence more more than other specialties i i, I also have a uh, uh basic knowledge of i'm i'm right now working with a project on uh, i with the alumni of iit chennai with our uh, breast cancer foundation on uh, artificial intelligence and detecting the microcalcification on the mammogram which is something which is very easily missed and it's going to make a life or death difference to the patient by diagnosing the ca breast early so but it is not going to uh, totally eliminate the radiologists it's only going to make their field better and the diagnosis more accurate it's going to be a huge addition and a complementary thing the way laparoscopy or now the robo how it, it, it the robo is not going to replace the surgeon it's 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 only giving him that additional degree of precision and comfort and uh, better patient care same thing with any form of ai with yes. you know with our training uh, there's been such a shift in training numbers in the last uh, 10 to 15 years so for instance you know if you look at rheumatology it uh, there were hardly one or two institutions offering the training uh, maybe 15 years ago and now there are so many more seats per year that you can think about so the question is is do we now have a glut of uh, uh, specialists and uh, is that going to uh, is specialization going to actually affect a doctor's chance of getting a job in the future is it better that they stay as a generalist is that going to be more of a yes, yes. if if we look at a short term perspective the answer would be yes but in the long term as i said sub specialization only is the way forward if if you are going to talk about something 8 to 10 years later it is going to be the super specialist and the sub specialist and not the generalist who will thrive so already now we have we have in this discussion we have uh, nitin manohar who's a, a dm uh, um, uh, neuro anesthetist sometime back we didn't we didn't have that uh, concept in the country we have uh, dr nishant sampat who who's a neurophysiologist and working in a corporate hospital with uh, in the same hospital where dr pata is there he's not working in a government setup so neurophysiology was something we we never thought uh the corporate would encourage so the way forward is going to be sub specialization and they will not be in uh, dearth of a job or anything like that if we see we started with ctvs we used to call it when we were in jipmer cardio thoracic vascular surgery now cardiac surgery is separate thoracic surgery is a separate branch vascular surgery is a separate branch in which there is an endovascular and open vascular surgeries and in cardiac surgery adult pediatric cardiology and transplant surgery are three different branches for example in kims today we have three departments the adult cardiac surgery department does only adult cardiac work pediatric cardiac surgery department does the pediatric work and the transplant surgery does only transplants it does not do any other thing so ctvs has become like seven or eight and all all the people are having the uh, uh, job so the the volume needing that sort of specialist care is also going to grow So the reason I asked is when we are looking at the incoming, you know, after the super specialty meet, there are many seats going vacant in uh, many of these niche uh, 
But yeah. I, I'll, I'll rephrase the question, Suma, if you don't mind. Yeah. How are you attracting just past super specialists to corporate sector? What are your incentives? Why will they choose you? We have to give them a guaranteed income, guaranteed salary for two years, irrespective of low volumes to begin with. Once they cross that phase of one to two years, if they are good, the patients will start coming and they will go into the uh, uh, no loss and then to the profit zone. But if the corporates have a short outlook that at the end of six months, they are going to take their earning statement and say, we have paid you say 20 lakhs and you have generated 10 lakhs. You're in a minus of 10 lakhs. You, 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 you have to look for another job. If we have that sort of a mindset, those departments will not grow. Yeah, now there are uh, a lot of youngsters who will watch this program. Uh, 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 who should uh, uh, take up uh, corporate leadership uh, after MBBS? What course should do one undergo and how to become leaders? And who should not take up uh, this management at all? In fact, so this, I can add in one more thing there. Should you take it up after MBBS or after the post-graduation? I would definitely say we should take it up not only after post-graduation, but after working after a post-graduation for at least two years. Mm -hmm. Doing graduation is different from working. And MBBS is nothing. We know We know when we come out of house agency, we, we are just uh, a fish out of the water. We just don't know anything. Mm -hmm. It's in the, in, in, during the residency training that we learn sort of working. But once we become a resident, it, it's, a, it's a whole new ball game. There are a lot of accountability that creeps in. So we should work for two years. A resident is always under the vicarious blanket of his... Which specialty uh, should uh, somebody take up to come, come into management? Which specialty? I, I, I would, I, as, as I mentioned, the departmental systems are better cut out for uh, management training like radiology or laboratory medicine or uh, uh, anesthesia and intensive care. These are departmental systems. A clinician, again, when he works, he... he he works around a, a, a self-circled microenvironment with support systems. Whereas an anesthetist or an intensivist or a laboratory person works in a department system with a HOD and with technicians and all that with, with, with a hierarchy. So there, there is a lot of interdepartmental issues and, and uh, collaborations that need to be done. So the experience which comes by working in a department will definitely aid and for, uh, make a primer for management training. Who shouldn't take up management? Surgeons. Uh, if if, <laughs> no, I, I show, if I had to add here, all the government sector medical superintendents are surgeons. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's because they, why, they but that's they bring, no, that is because they think they bring the business to the hospital. No, no, no. In the, the government it. sector, all yeah. medical superintendents are surgeons. Pridhya, I can correct me. Oh, okay. I think it's a matter of seniority. I don't think medical superintendent, uh, I think it's uh, by default, yeah. yeah. the position becomes in uh, government uh, service. But uh, in uh, like AIMS, uh, Geetanjali, when uh, on her, uh, uh, after her talk discussion, she clearly mentioned that, you know, we should know your limit. You should be, you should lead the team and leave the specialist to do their job. So even in All India Institute, though she's the director, she has qualified people to do finance. She has qualified people to do the other work. Uh, Geetanjali, please correct me if I'm wrong. Hey, uh, AIMS director is a respiratory physio, uh, physician. Yeah. Uh, and in UK, a lot of the uh, you know medical directors actually do come mm -hmm. from anesthesia department. Radiologist also is, again, medical director from radiologist. And I think Chandra is very right in saying that I think... Uh, uh, being an anesthetist or in the laboratory or in radiology, uh, you need to actually have a lot more, uh, you know, interpersonal uh, relationships. Uh, so that I think that that is actually to answer I, I to know. answer Dr. Patas question. I think I'll choose the easier way. Who should not come in? That will be an answer for like you, you can just uh, extrapolate it to who should come in. Like as a surgeon, he would know that uh, the first thing a surgeon should know is like when not when not to operate. That, that's what uh, even in Bailey and Love, uh, uh, Bailey says, like, you should know when not to operate rather than when to operate. So that when you should not come in. One is if you if you want fixed timings, if you want a nine to five job and not be disturbed at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And, uh, and all those things you want. You want family time, you want a five day week and nine to five or, or total relaxation on Sundays or something like that, then management is not at all. This is a 
ट्वेंटी फोर इंटू सेवन जॉब वेदर आई एम देर फिजिकली इन द हॉस्पिटल और नॉट आई ऑलवेज हैव टू बी अवेलेबल एट एट इन इन मिनट्स नोटिस सो if if you want specific timings and those things it will not work out at all second is you shouldn't be too sensitive a bit of shamelessness here and there helps because we are we are dealing with the the major stakeholders whom we deal with or the doctors who who come in with a uh, uh, certain uh, self respect and ego uh, because of the, the the way they get trained and all that definitely they they are uh, are the uh, uh, in in the societal cream so you are dealing with a multitude of people with multitude of egos so every time if you are sensitive and take things to heart it's it's going to be very tough um, a bit of shamelessness and i would say if, if you have little socializing you can just uh, if you, you get upset over something you can just drown it with a couple of pegs so i shouldn't i shouldn't talk about it on a medical forum especially with the, uh, being on the liver transplant side but if if you have if you can chill out it it need not be it need not be just alcohol it could be so many other ways if if you have that capacity to come out of sensitivities then it is good if you are, if you are too sensitive it's difficult and again as i said if you are going to be absolutely play by the rules if you are very protocolized and i will not step one foot away from this is this is what has been told in the uh, bhagavad gita and by mahatma gandhi and this is how i'm going to go then that is tough we should have a more utilitarian approach for the final result that is good bit of a compromise here and there has to be done especially in the uh, indian system that that is uh, true for across businesses and across industries we have to do it i am not even telling you should be immoral or unethical but too much of rigidity and straightness also will not go hand in hand with um, uh, leadership at the higher levels you have to be little little flexible in in attitude back to you vidya for winding up yeah i think we had a, a pretty interesting session and a lot of uh, view points from everyone it's probably thrown up on many more topics that need to be thrashed out in some uh, future forum uh, thank you chandra for uh, joining us and being candid and uh, you didn't uh, miss your words uh, for your honesty and thanks so much uh, for uh, agreeing to uh, interview you if you may if i may say so and uh, thanks everybody for joining in and uh, we'll meet again next Thursday with another episode, and uh, it's going to be a hot topic. I'm just, I forgot. I thought I thought Dr. Suma would uh, uh, raise that point, but she forgot. So I have to add that okay. one of my Go one ahead. of my chill out things. I am the president of the Kamala Hassan Fans Association of Telangana State. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I forgot in my introduction fan. about you being a movie buff and also about you being a musician. Yes. Uh, Uh, sorry about that. I also yes. missed out. So I hope I hope Kamal will. I hope you people in Tamil Nadu are going to elect him the CM, and then I'll be the advisor <laughs> on the health issue. Chandra, how yeah. come you are the uh, president of uh, only Telangana State Kamala Hassan Fans Association? I thought it would be all India. <laughs> Too much of politics there. Corporate hospitals are nothing. Uh, you come into the Fans Association and see there's so much <laughs> politics. <laughs> Wonderful. Nice. Yeah. So now you know how he handles his stress. So he, he should have something to chill out. So he's a he's the president of a fans club. So and he's actually what should I say? Really brazen about it. He, just like your Rajni fan, he's like uh, you know he, he doesn't care. That's it. I am a Kamal Hassan fan. That's it. No no questions asked. <laughs> so um, thank you everybody for joining thanks nalla and uh, many it's others fun. who brought all the perspectives out and uh, we've been here for more than uh, i mean a long time one and uh, one hour and 45 minutes so we'll need to close tomorrow's a working day so uh, thank you everyone for joining and we'll meet again next thursday bye bye everyone